Hey everyone, Ms. Butler here. I have a short video to kick us off our acid base unit. And this topic for um, before we get into acid base specifically is about solutions. So we have three goals we wanna be able to define um, just some vocab related to solutions. We wanna know the difference between soluble things and insoluble things. And then we wanna use um, solubility rules to decide if something is soluble or insoluble. All right, some vocab for you to write down. Um, when we make a solution, we have a few different parts. The solvent is what we are um, doing the dissolving in, so it's the usually the liquid. For us, typically the solvent is going to be water, but technically it could be a different liquid. The solute is what are we putting in the liquid to try to get to dissolve, so that's usually a solid powder of some sort that I'm putting the solute in the solvent, stirring it up and mixing in order to make what's called a solution and the solution is a homogeneous mixture, just a review from first semester. That means we have two different types of particles. For in, in this case, we have the actual solid particles and we have the water particles. They are not bonded together, but they are evenly mixed. That's what the homogeneous means because they are evenly mixed, just not bonded together. An aqueous solution is a very specific solution where the solvent must be water. So this example right here is an aqueous solution because they used water as the solvent. All right, in the left-hand column of your Cornell notes, we have this question here, what happens when a solid dissolves? So I want you to just kind of think about that. When you actually put something in a liquid like this, um, here we have sugar going into some iced tea or some hot tea maybe, um, what is actually happening to that solid sugar? Um, you might be thinking, well, obviously we talked last slide about how it's a homogeneous mixture, so we are evenly mixing the solid particles in with the liquid particles. Um, you might even say, well, the solid disappears, right? Because after that sugar in this picture here is stirred up, we don't see it anymore. And I should say disappears because we know the sugar is still there. You can taste it if you take a sip of that tea, um, but you can't see it anymore with your, with your eye. It's almost hiding behind the liquid. Um, and then the last thing, and this might be new, is some kids say the particles separate. And this is true for certain things and not so true for others. So for example, in this picture here, if we're putting sugar in tea, those sugar particles are gonna stay fully intact. They're just um, essentially going to spread out evenly in the water, so spread out that the naked eye can't see them. Um, but if I have something ionic, like salt, sodium with chlorine, when I put salt in water, they are actually going to separate into Na plus and Cl minus. So you're essentially breaking bonds, but that's um, a loose term because they, they're essentially not totally broken from the, the, the true ionic form. But what we're doing is we're, we're splitting it temporarily into the positive and negative ions, and that's for ionic things. So we'll talk more about that in a second. So water is really good at dissolving things. Let's talk about some properties of that water as a molecule has that makes it so great for dissolving. Um, water, individual water molecules have this bent Vesper geometry. We learned about the Vesper geometries. So if you look at the Lewis structure, the covalent Lewis structure looks like this and it makes a bent shape. So there's actually little lone pairs on here. And based off our periodic trends, because um, water or because oxygen is more electronegative, what that means is it's pulling electrons in these shared bonds. It's pulling electrons towards itself um, and hogging it or stealing those electrons more from the hydrogen. I shouldn't say stealing because they are sharing, just not sharing very well. And what happens because electrons are negative, the the oxygen in water gets a partial negative charge because the the electrons in this bond are spending more of their time over here. And when that happens, that makes the hydrogens partially positive. They have a slight positive charge. Okay, this, when we have a molecule with a partial negative and a partial positive, that means the molecule has what's called a dipole moment and it's called a polar covalent molecule. And we learned this in bonding. It just means that they are sharing electrons, but they're not sharing equally. And so because water has this bent shape, it is um, with this kind of 105 degree bond angle, it makes it polar covalent because of the unequal sharing of electrons. And that polarity is what allows water to dissolve things really well. We talked about NaCl, sodium chloride, table salt in the last example. Sodium chloride is gonna split when it gets put in water into Na plus 
and that's going to go near the partial negative of the water. So negative likes positive. So those are going to go near each other. And the NaCl is also going to split into Cl minus ions. And that the Cl minus are going to go towards the hydrogens because partial positive likes partial negative. And so because water has a partial negative and partial positive, it's really good at dissolving ionic things because ionic things can break apart into full positive and full negative charges. All right, hydration is exactly what I just talked about. It's where the positive ends, or I should say the partial positive hydrogens of water are greatly attracted to negatively charged ions in a crystal structure, in an ionic structure, and the negative ends of water, which are the par partial negative oxygens, are greatly attracted to the positive ions from the ionic solid. Hydration of ions will cause the salt to fall apart. So for example, we talked about Na plus being in an ionic compound with Cl minus, right? That's going to um, essentially split apart into positive Na and negative chlorine so that the positive Na's can go near the partial negative um, oxygen and the negative chlorines can go near the partial positive hydrogen. So when the ionic substances or the salts dissolve in water, they break into those positive and negative ions. Here's a great example. I have a positive ionic salt. You might see those hidden polyatomics. There's one right there and there's another. So there's two polyatomic ions. One happens to be positively charged. One is negatively charged, and it is a solid. When I put it in water, so this water is just indicating above the arrow that I'm adding it to water, okay? We have NH4 with a positive charge. AQ means aqueous, dissolved in water, and NO3 minus aqueous. So essentially, this ionic substance, which had positive bonded with negative, one of each, positive one, negative one, split apart into the positive ammonium polyatomic and the negative nitrate polyatomic. So here's a great picture of hydration with sodium chloride, NaCl. When it is regular like table salt sitting at your table, we have the positive sodiums and the negative chlorines all together and notice the actual formula is neutral, NaCl, because every one positive of the gray cancels out the negative green um, particle. And so I have solid NaCl and when I put it in water, I did not write water above the arrow because that's implied with these aqueous symbols, that means dissolved in water. You can see it splits into Na plus and Cl minus. How did I know it was plus one and minus one? Um, just to review, I get those charges from the periodic table. Here's a zoomed in picture of hydration. Remember water, the oxygen is partially negative. Do you see how the body of or the face of the Mickey Mouse, this red negative oxygen or partially negative oxygen all surrounds the positive sodium and then Mickey Mouse's ears, the partially positive hydrogens, they stick their ears towards the negative chlorine ion. That's what hydration is and that's why we cannot see the table salt anymore once we stir it up and dissolve it in water. It's because it gets surrounded through hydration with all of these water molecules. All right, a little bit more vocab, an electrolyte. You might have heard electrolytes with Gatorade. Electrolytes are solutions that conduct an electric current. Our body wants to have some electrolytes um, when we're exercising. But there's kind of two examples here. A strong electrolyte is when we have soluble salts, so ionic things, mean, and soluble means they dissolve, um, that completely dissociate into solution. So that means they completely break into ions. I'll even say into the positive cations and negative anions. Whereas a non-electrolyte is a solution where we have dissolving, maybe like sugar in water, but the solute does not make ions, so there is no electric current. So water doesn't um, conduct a current when it's pure. Sugar with water does not conduct. Alcohols, things like that. Okay, so a strong electrolyte is when I dissolve something and it breaks into the positive and negative ions. And when it does that, it is able to um, conduct an electric current. So if you look here, here's water with some sort of ionic salt and it breaks into positive and negative ions and you can see that light bulb is fully lit up. Here's one that kind of like a little in between, we call it a weak electrolyte. The light bulb is not glowing as bright. There's a couple of ions, but most of it stayed together. And then this would be like sugar in water where the sugar particles all stay together, no positive and negative ions. Even though the dissolving in water has happened, because there's no positive and negative charges, we cannot get the light bulb to light, no electrical current. 
All right, so solubility is how well something dissolves. So the solubility of ionic things, just a reminder, ionic is when we have a positive charge bonded with a negative charge. You don't see that in the formula because the charges cancel each other out because we crisscross them. It's usually a, um, a metal with a non-metal. Um, but the solubility of ionic substances varies greatly. So for example, NaCl is very soluble, AgCl not so much. So there is a wide range. But water can also dissolve non-ionic things and when I say non-ionic, I'm talking about covalent things. So ionic and covalent. Um, alcohols and sugars are examples of covalent. Those are usually going to be our non-metals bonded to non-metals. Okay, fats also don't dissolve in water because they are non-polar. So here's the main phrase I need you to write down. Like dissolves like. Okay, so if I have a polar covalent solvent, that's the liquid, like water, it's going to dissolve things that are polar, covalent also, and ionic because of that part or because of the positive and negative charges in hydration. If I have a nonpolar solvent, meaning they're sharing their electrons equally, that's only going to dissolve nonpolar things. So you've heard maybe the expression oil and water don't mix. Oil is very nonpolar and water is very polar. They don't dissolve in each other because they because of this phrase like dissolves like. The polar water and the nonpolar oil do not mix well. All right, so a pre precipitation is when, or we get a precipitate, when um, there's an insoluble, meaning not dissolve at all, solid, that's formed when we mix two aqueous solutions. So often, or if you look here, I have two different clear chemicals. When I mix them, you see that cloudiness. That solid right there is called a precipitate. That solid that we formed is called insoluble because it is not dissolving in the, li the liquid. Um, a lot of times in lab, we will separate the precipitate so we could separate out these white particles um, using a filtering system. We did that in class where we had the funnel with our filter paper in there and you collected the solid up here and then the liquid dripped down. Um, in order to determine what the precipitate is and if there will be a precipitate, you have to know what's called solubility rules. And there's gonna be a few I'm gonna ask you to memorize, so let's take a look at those. All right, these are the solubility rules. Um, and so you'll see that there are ions listed. I did highlight some of them. Those are the ones I want you to make flashcards for and memorize. The other ones we will use, but I don't expect you to memorize them. Okay, and so here's how they work. For example, NO3 minus is called a nitrate. Okay, the nitrates are always soluble, meaning they always dissolve with no exceptions. So as an example, if I see Na. NO3, that is a soluble compound, meaning it will dissolve because it has nitrate. Same thing even, let's do like PBNO32, lead to nitrate. That is going to be always aqueous and dissolve because um, it has a nitrate. Okay, chloride. Chlorides are always soluble, so if there's a chlorine in the ionic compound, it will dissolve. It's soluble, except for when it's with silver, mercury 2, and lead 2. So, for example, these guys, here, maybe I'll make this one green so you know that it does dissolve. And then I'll switch to red for the no-goes. So, AgCl doesn't dissolve. It's insoluble. It's an exception. Um, mercury to chloride does not, and then lead to chloride does not. Um, hydroxides is another one. Those are insoluble. They do not dissolve except for if there's calcium 2 plus, barium 2 plus, and strontium 2 plus, and any of the first column, the alkali metals. So for example, something that would be soluble would be like, oops, sodium hydroxide because that's in group 1a sodium's in the first column groups are the up and down columns so the alkali metals so sodium with hydroxide is soluble and they're telling me that calcium with hydroxide is soluble but if i did something like um copper with hydroxide that would not be soluble because mostly hydroxides are insoluble 
Okay, you get the idea. Sodium, always soluble. Uh, the ammonium polyatomic, always soluble. And the potassium polyatomic, always soluble. So you notice the positive ions will have something negative attached to them. The negative ions will have something positive attached. But if you know the always soluble rules, then you can figure out um, based off essentially that, like, for example, if, if it's sodium with um, phosphate, it's going to be soluble because it has a sodium. Here's my little trick or rules to remember those. Okay, so I think about saggy pants. Back when I was in high school, that was the big um, thing that kids got dress coded for. Boys specifically was um, pants sagging down too low, showing their underwear. And so they got nagged by the administration for their saggy pants. So these guys are always soluble. The nitrates, acetates, which I know I didn't ask you to memorize, but it's one of them. And then the group one, so column one, that's the alkali metals, the whole column. Okay, so they are always soluble. And then SAG, sulfates, SO4, 2 minus polyatomic, ammonium polyatomic, and group 17, the halogen. So like fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, all the way down. So these are always soluble, meaning no matter who they're partnered with, they will always dissolve. There are two exceptions. The first I remember as PMS. So lead, mercury and silver pms lead mercury silver when those are with these ones with the pink ast asterisks they are insoluble so the sulfates are always soluble except for when it's lead sulfate mercury sulfate and silver sulfate and also with group 17 the group 17 is always soluble except for like lead chloride mercury chloride silver chloride or lead fluoride mercury fluoride silver fluoride and then the other one for the exceptions is castro bear, calcium, strontium, and barium. And those are exceptions with sulfates as well. So just sulfates for this, see this little green asterisk, green asterisk. So sulfates, when it's calcium sulfate, that will not dissolve, insoluble. Strontium sulfate, insoluble. Barium sulfate, insoluble. Otherwise, all the sulfates are soluble. On the wall in our classroom, we have a nice chart like this that works most of the time. Um, you'll see some unique things in lab from time to time. But for example, let's say I have a chemical that is calcium plus two with, um, let's do with carbonate, which is minus two. When I crisscross those charges, we know plus two and minus two cancel, so I get CaCO3. This chemical, if I look on my chart, here's calcium, here's carbonate. I drop down calcium carbonate, insoluble, right? Calcium carbonate, insoluble. That means it will not dissolve. And so if we do a reaction and we make this as a product, it will be solid instead of aqueous. So this chart's kind of nice because I can see, okay, for example, copper, is soluble with fluorine, it's soluble with chlorine, copper is soluble with bromine, not soluble with hydroxide, right? So soluble um, is it means it's aqueous, it will dissolve, insoluble, solid will not dissolve. You'll see some are slightly soluble. You're gonna get mixed results for those in the labs. Maybe you see a little cloudiness sometimes, but it really then it depends on the concentration. So essentially you it kind of dissolves, but it also kind of stays as a precipitate. All right, I would like you to pause the video and try these. Use the chart, use the solubility rule tricks, use that solubility rule list um, to decide if these compounds would be soluble, which is aqueous, or insoluble, meaning it won't dissolve and stay as a solid. So pause the video and then I'll put up the answers. All right, here's what I see. I see nitrate which is always soluble. So because this has a nitrate, that's why it is soluble. All right, I see in this guy hydroxide, which we said almost never dissolves, except for when it's with the first column elements, the alkali metals, or calcium, barium, strontium. Lead is not calcium, bar barium, or strontium, so this is insoluble. I see on this guy ammonium, NH4 plus is one of my always soluble rules. So that means this guy will dissolve. It's aqueous or soluble. I see um, sodium on this one. Sodium is one of my always soluble. So no matter who he's paired up with, it will dissolve. I see hydroxide, which normally is insoluble, but calcium with hydroxide is one of the exceptions, right? 
the first column on the periodic table, and then calcium, barium, and strontium, when paired with hydroxide, will dissolve. So this is a exception for hydroxide for that OH group. And then lastly, I see carbonate. And if you look on your list, carbonates are usually insoluble unless they're with the first column on the periodic table or ammonium, like unless they're essentially unless they, um, um, CO3 is paired up with the ones that are always, no matter what, soluble, it's going to be insoluble. So because this has a carbonate, it is insoluble. All right, now you're going to practice and actually see this in action. You're looking for precipitates. Those are things that are insoluble and solid, or you're looking for really no change at all, which means everything was aqueous and dissolved. So a couple of things. You're going to be doing this lab here, okay? So you should have a copy of this, and kind of like the solubility chart, here you're going to be mixing Ag plus with I minus, Ag plus with the hydroxide, Ag plus with the carbonate. So that's where you kind of match it all up. You will be doing this in well plates. So if you see on yours, you have 16 boxes on your well plates, you'll get two of them, okay? We have three across, four down, so you can use a second well plate, and that's how you will have one, two, three, four across, and one, two, three, four down. So then you'll have two extra roads that you don't use at all. Okay, so you'll put two well plates next to each other, and essentially you're gonna recreate this chart, right, where I mix in the first well, I'm gonna mix my AG plus with I minus, and then the AG will just go across this first row, and then my I minus will go down this column. So that way it's organized and it matches your chart. Okay, let me show you real quick. Let's see if I can. Hold on one sec. All right, I figured it out. Sorry about that. Okay, so when you get ready to do the lab, you'll be given two well plates. And you'll see up here we have all of the positive ions and all of the negative ions. So it goes behind. So the blue is for the copper, right? The orange is for the iron. Um, and so what you're going to do is you're going to take one of these to your station and you are going to add the drops to the well plate. So make sure you and your partner are on the same page about how you've set up your well plates. It should just match the paper, okay, so that you know what's what, or you can even use a sheet of paper to label. And so you'll add two to three drops of that chemical, come back and put it nicely. Please double check all of the labels, okay? If um, there are some that are, like for example, you see this yellow label, um, is on both of these bottles, but they are different chemicals, so I even labeled the pipettes, so we shouldn't have any mix-up or, or contamination. Um, put them back nicely so the next group can get them, make sure they're in the correct spots, but you should just be taking one at a time to get your wells set up, and then you can start adding and mixing, okay? So once you actually mix the chemicals in your well, so like in your very first well, you're going to have... Um, ag mixed with i you are going to describe what you see if there's a precipitate tell me what color it is remember you're looking for any cloudiness any chunks any um bright color change those those particles that change colors are the precipitate and then what you're going to do is you are going to write what the new compound is that forms so for example um we're just focusing don't worry about these down here that's just to help me when i get the chemicals you're just focused on the positive and negative ions but let's do um let's do this box right here all right so what you'll do is you will put your observations in the top half what you uh, what you see for all of this all of the wells just a little bullet point description and then I'm going to write the solid formula if I observed a solid. If I don't observe any solid, then you just say aqueous or soluble. But here's what I know. I got copper with a plus 2 and then hydroxide. I'm actually going to add real quick my parentheses. So this is OH minus 1, CO3 minus 2, PO4 minus 3 because I like my polyatomics in parentheses. Okay, and you can do what I'm doing here in blue off to the side, but remember with ionic compounds, we crisscross. So the one from hydroxide goes to copper, Cu1, which you can leave out if you don't want to write the one, and the two goes outside of the protected polyatomic, OH2. 
two. So if I observe a solid here, I'll write it, what color I see, anything like that. And then I'm going to crisscross the charges, Cu1 parentheses OH close parentheses two is my solid. Let's try one more just to review the crisscrossing. How about we do this guy? So I have Pb plus two with the phosphate PO4 minus three. When we crisscross this, three goes to the PB, so PB3. I protect my polyatomic PO4, close the parenthesis, this two goes outside of the parenthesis. All right, so if you um, observe any color change or any solid flakes, you'll write that and then you'll crisscross to get the formula of that solid. If you do not observe any change, it literally looks just like a clear liquid still when you're done, then you'll say aqueous or all aqueous. All right, have fun. One last thing, when you're done, I suggest you take a picture of your well plates so we can talk about it more in class. So once you have all of the well plates reacted, why don't you snap a picture of it so we have it to look at together.